So hello, everybody, and welcome to the September show. Um, and happy birthday, Cardano, I think we can still say. Um, three years and counting, lots of cause for celebration and also lots of content today. Um, Aparna, we've got a bit of a bit of a bumper birthday edition, haven't we? Absolutely, Tim. It's like what a couple of hours of content. We've worked on this for a little while now, so I think we should just go ahead and dive right in and get started. <laughs> Let's dive right in. And look, dates. Let's talk about dates. It's the question on a lot of people's lips. It's a birthday. It's all about dates. Sure. Are we going to share some detailed roadmap dates today? Well, not exactly detailed, but we'll definitely share some dates. Like we said, it's, it's so much content in this show that we do have constant forward momentum with with a lot of it. So it's not going to be detailed roadmap dates per se, but you will get some dates for a couple of the key areas okay, that, okay, that so, we have. So, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts going on here, aren't there? Yes. And, you know, in, in, and this is specific specifically for Gogan, right? So Gogan, there is a lot of when Gogan, but it's more so I'd like to focus on the what is Gogan and and the why are we doing Gogan and even the how, because these are the things that are going to make this product successful in the long term. So Gogan has multiple areas, multiple parts, and it's not just Gogan that we're working on. You know, we've got a lot going on with Voltaire, as you guys have been seeing, two and a half thousand people have signed up for for uh, Project Catalyst. So great success there for fun too. Um, and then there's also things in the identity portion. There's experiences that we're doing with Shelly for delegators and state pool operators. There's deadless updates. I mean, there's quite a bit, partnerships and marketing and everything that we're going on under the hood. So yes, lots of moving parts. You got that right. So Gogan is still rolling out in the three phases that we've spoken about in the past. That's still kind of the way we're rolling it, yeah? Yeah. So technically there are three phases, right? So there's... Um, uh, well, in a way, there's almost four. There's the metadata piece that starts first. It's a little bit of Shelley, but we'll talk we'll talk about that in the show. Then there's the multi-asset ledger piece before before you get into the actual monetary policies with Plutus. And then there's another piece that that is kind of out there in terms of uh, usability uh, from an application standpoint, and that's Marlow and what we're doing with Marlow. And we'll talk about that in the show as well. Um, however, it's it's not just that from a tech technology standpoint or what we're launching from a product standpoint, it's also about how we're doing it. So for example, there's the developer onboarding and the marketing angle. Like how do we get developers onto the, the platform? What are we working on with the CF to allow for that? Then there's the developer experience piece. So that's around playgrounds and, and how do we collect the voice of customer and or in this case, voice of developer to have developers come in, work on use cases, play with the code, and then tell us if we're moving in the right direction. What do we need to help them get there? Um, then there's also utility. For example, ERC-20, there's going to be um, some discussion around that uh, during the show. Uh, testing platforms, testing frameworks. How do we provide robust testing tools for, for developers to code? And then finally, utility in terms of the developers that are not Haskellers or that are that don't want to go that way and more, you know, more use case oriented. So whether it's financial contracts or whether it's a certain other type of a thing, maybe a low code, easier method of, of being able to put smart contracts together, uh, that portion as well. So user experience. Yes, multiple multiple phases, multiple different rollouts, multiple multiple streams, Tim. Okay, so before we get into that, maybe let's just touch on Shelly and give a little bit of an update on where we are there. Because of course, it's not over yet. Shelly is still continuing to evolve, still continuing to improve and be optimized. And, and we've kind of been looking at it from a couple of different angles, haven't we, about how we kind of move that experience forwards. Uh, yes, and from that, it's all about the user. So from a product management standpoint, we focus on the user in the market. And for Shelly, it's about stake pool operators that are running the network, and it's about delegators that are delegating on the network. So those are the two experiences that we're focused on. And obviously, we've seen remarkable growth in stake pool operators and the community around that uh, since July. Uh, and that's a significant part of how we need to evolve the network. So uh, let's maybe start with talking a little bit about that. So um, I actually caught up with some of the members of the team who are currently looking at that stake pool operator experience, particularly around the area of parameters and where we go with that uh, to support the ecosystem longer term. So um, we're going to show a clip now. There's a much longer interview if you want to access that via YouTube. You can access the link, uh, which should be showing for you now. But let's show just a few highlights of that conversation just to kind of frame this uh, for everybody. So tell us a little bit more about how, from a kind of a parameters perspective, things like decentralization and also network security are going to be covered here. In Bitcoin, the problem is that people 
I mean, if they just care about maximizing their profit, they uh, tend to flock into pools and and somehow the, the bigger pool becomes the the less overhead there is with the cost. So so the pools tend to be, become bigger and bigger, and which is the opposite of decentralization because we end up with a few very powerful tools uh, pools. So. Um, we try to, as Katarina explained, uh, design the system so that that doesn't happen in Cardano. And uh, for that, one very important parameter is this K parameter. So um, the the ideal number of pools we want, uh, which at the moment is set at 150, but there's debate about uh, changing that. And um, so the idea is that um, once a pool reaches this, this limit of 1 over 150 in our case, uh, then the rewards, then it doesn't get uh, more rewards. And um, so pools can become bigger, can can become larger. So there is no hard um, limit. So it's not forbidden by the protocol, but just the rewards don't grow anymore if a pool becomes too large. So if uh, players are, or delegators are indeed rational, then they wouldn't delegate to a pool if it becomes too large because then everybody gets less profits. So that's... And that's uh, right. And that's why yeah. delegators, I suppose, should keep an eye on the saturation. Exactly, uh, exactly. So if a pool, um, I mean, basically the best situation is if, if a pool is exactly saturated, then the rewards are highest. But if it grows beyond that, then uh, because the pool rewards don't increase any longer, but it's more and more people that share the, this capped uh, amount of rewards, then everybody, every individual delegator would get less. So it's important that they keep an eye on it. And if a pool is too large, they should delegate to a smaller pool. And uh, so that's, that's, the, yeah. that's the key parameter. And that's the key parameter. Is, so what are the other parameters that people need to need to know about? Right. I mean, I talked about the, the K, for, so the um, saturation point. Basically, it determines how large a pool can grow um, until it doesn't get more rewards. And that, of course, um, creates a problem that somebody could be very sneaky and say, okay, um, but I want to have a bigger pool, so I just create two pools and I pretend that I'm somebody else. Um, I mean, I don't tell anybody that it's both pools belong to me. I mean, it's just an IP address or, or some public key, so people don't know. And I could just set up lots and lots of pools and let all of them grow to, to this uh, saturation points. And then people would think everything is perfectly decentralized, lots of small pools. But in reality, I own all of them. And that's called a uh, civil attack. And uh, that is, is critical. I mean, we have to think of how to prevent that. And that's where another important parameter comes in. So the idea is that you <clears throat> have to attach pledge to a pool, which technically just means the amount of money you delegate to your own pool. And somehow the formulas that we developed um, say that the that pool gets slightly higher rewards if this delegation to your own pool is higher. And that means that if you do, if you try this attack and set up several pools, then obviously because your own money is finite, you have to split your own money amongst those pools. And then each of those pools gets a bit less. Then, and then all those pools are less attractive because they generate smaller rewards. So the hope is that if somebody does that, um, we can't prevent that. Um, but if somebody does that, those pools will be less attractive to the community. And then delegators won't delegate to those pools. So that's this A0 parameter that determines how high this influence is between your own, um, this pledge delegating to your own pool and the rewards. And let's bring in uh, Colin now, because as you say, Lars, this. There's a lot of things to consider. There's enormous mm -hmm. complexity behind the scenes. With it comes that flexibility and that adaptability. But it is challenging getting to a point that keeps uh, keeps all parts of the ecosystem happy, I guess. Big discussions also around uh, the change in some of the key parameters, like the K parameter, which ultimately will affect um, basically how different pools do respectively, whether the larger pools tend to dominate, whether you get a much more even spread across the network. Perhaps you can just share a little bit about where the thinking is at the moment in terms of that. Well, in terms of the long-term direction, that's largely set by our, our researchers. So that we're kind of working within that as a constraint and then coming out with a, a plan. So if, if you can imagine a, a road trip, we're going, you know, the, the research might say we're going to Edinburgh and our, our product team builds us a tour bus. And I'm kind of Google Maps saying, turn left here. And in terms of our current thinking, I think we're going to have a couple changes. One of them is our own staking pools. We are have some concerns over the way they were initially set up, uh, particularly in the way that maybe they are attracting delegation. 
away from other smaller pools. And so we will certainly be rebalancing those. Uh, there are some technology changes that we are waiting on for the incubation business, but those are things I hope that we're going to be uh, discussing uh, very shortly in terms of how we plan to help um, you know, build up and, and start new pools. I think one of the challenges when we talk about things like a, a Nash equilibrium or a long-term stable model is uh, that transition process of how do pools initially attract delegation and build up you know, a business and a brand and a franchise. And that may be challenging in an environment where you can't necessarily directly uh, reach out and contact your customers, for example, uh, in the staking business that it's, there's a degree of um, maybe not anonymity, but but uh, maybe pseudonymity uh, in there where it, it makes kind of managing a brand challenging. Uh, when we're looking at K as a parameter, that's one of them that strongly limits the the size of a large pool. And as a very large pool operators, uh, IOG is, is certainly one of the most affected groups on any changes in parameters like that and in, in the way it works. And so uh, one of the things we've been looking at very closely is, is what kind of, of processes and how should we transition from 1K, maybe the, the one that we started with initially, uh, and, and into a value that we want to go to long term. And in particular in that, uh, K is a very challenging parameter because it requires a large number of actors. And whether it's our internal pools, uh, the delegators to all take actions. And in our case, we would be splitting uh, many of the pools into smaller pools. Um, we want to do so in a way that doesn't harm the rest of the ecosystem so that we uh, I think I, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to know that we're going to be moving many of our pools private and and so they don't take delegation from other pools um, but again this is one where uh, doing this in a way that's safe uh, obviously we have security concerns over how we uh, manage our own funds whether they're on hardware wallets and then there's just a limit in somebody punching the codes in. So we have to think about how those kind of things work uh, and, and managing that process. And this is in many ways very similar to what other pool operators deal with who are also trying to come out with a business plan and manage their funds and, and look at how these changes are affecting them. So we've been quite involved uh, in providing feedback and we, we work very closely uh, with, with many of the other stake pool operators. Uh, I know I've been in, attending many of the calls recently and getting more involved in that community because they share many of the same concerns we do on how we're going to make this work. So the whole thing is sort of being looked at holistically, I suppose. What's, what's coming next in this area and perhaps beyond on the research side that we can look forward to? Uh, so the research in incentives in general is a very active uh, area. Uh, so we are continuing to, uh, first of all, we stay close with the engineering team and the combination team in order to develop further the system and uh, receive uh, feedback from the community, see how people, uh, users react and uh, uh, take this into account uh, in uh, adapting uh, uh, the, the mechanism and so on. Uh, one uh, problem that uh, we are working on uh, this period uh, is, uh, is called like censorship. And just to say a few sentences about this, uh, in order for a new pool to get registered, uh, a, a, trans a special transaction should be added in the blockchain, uh, in the blockchain uh, ledger. But uh, this transaction should be added by uh, the current uh, pool leaders that uh, run uh, the system. So uh, the current pool leaders maybe want to avoid the competition and they don't want uh, new pools to register maybe because if a new pool has a very good characteristic can be competitive and like uh, maybe this uh, could make them lower their margin and so on. So we would like to, uh, to find an uh, anti-censorship mechanism a mechanism that will incentivize uh, the pool operators uh, to include uh, the, uh, such uh, transactions. And of course, in this case, if there is uh, like uh, just one pool that uh, is, for example, honest, follows on, on always the instruction, then this transaction will be added. But given that in our model in incentives, we uh, we we consider all that all the users are rational, we don't consider that they uh, follow the protocol if this does not maximize their profit. We have like to solve this without assuming that 
a pool will add these transactions. And we are in the process like to, uh, to find this antecessor mechanism and uh, uh, like to solve also this aspect. And this is just one aspect. In general, we, uh, we, we continue the research in, uh, and in different uh, aspects of uh, the reward mechanism. And, uh, we, given the, the feedback and all uh, uh, the ongoing research, we are we adapting uh, like, uh, uh, and we rethinking uh, all uh, all uh, the all the aspects that we have uh, uh, designed until until now, and we try to to evolve them like in uh, for the best uh, for for to have like a stable uh, network and uh, to like to have uh, the best that, that we can have in, in this area. Great. Pauline, Katerina, Lars, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, thanks there to Katerina, Lars and to Colin for their time. As I say, there's a, a link to a longer version of that video over on YouTube if you want to have a bit of a deep dive into the complexities and the flexibility of setting parameters to kind of encourage the growth of the network and that, that balancing that we talked about. So let's maybe move now back to the delegation experience, Apana. Of course, central to that is is Daedalus. Mm -hmm. So it's it's Daedalus, and it's also the hardware wallets. I mean, there's there's an ecosystem of how people delegate and from where they delegate. And we've done a few focus groups with stake pool operators even on on how to even get into the multiple delegation, you know, one to n portion of things, which which seem quite normal for for how people want to delegate in the future. And uh, we've been working very hard with Vacuum Labs on that. So I wanted to introduce um, Philip, who's uh, new to the team, but he'll introduce himself as a business analyst and what we've been doing there. So rolling that clip. My name is Philip, and I started working for IHK. Well, it's almost two months since then, to be honest. So I'm really glad to be here. I'm a business analyst for wallets, you know, Daedalus and the backend address. Yeah, helping out here and there as much as I can. Um, I've been in the blockchain industry for, the couple, for a couple of years now already, working on various both public and private blockchains, trying to stay in the loop. And just being here is... Um, is a you know honor for me to be working here you know to, on, on a cutting edge technology and uh, uh, with people who are PhDs and scientists and who are leading the next wave of well in my opinion economy 3.0. So Philip, tonight we're um, we're talking about a few aspects of the overall Shelley experience and how we're evolving that. And of course for for delegators, the the wallet interface, the Daedalus interface is a is a crucial part of that. So perhaps you can just give us a bit of a run through about some of the areas we can expect to see some changes and some improvements soon. Yes, of course. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we are introducing is that you know so far the ranking of stake pools has been according to the latest epoch. But from our next upcoming update, we'll, we want to provide you with a more, let's say, real-time experience. So we are actually using a live stake to rank uh, the stake pools right now. So you should see an improvement in that part within the next update, basically. Yeah, that's actually a great feature for for uh, for our stake pool rankings because that was one of the more controversial topics, if you may, about how we're actually putting these rankings together. And and as you can tell, we're constantly trying to to fiddle with with the inputs and the outputs to make that a much better um, ranking experience for delegators to choose from. Um, so here's the other thing, though, we're we're also doing something that I know everybody's gonna be excited about, and uh, that's the automatic updates, right, Philip? Yes, that's true. So um, it's been one of the bigger pains, let's say, in Daedalus, at least from my point of view as a user. So right now we will have uh, an, a new user experience for updates. So once you once we roll out the next flight release, you will see um, a new type of notification, which, which is going to be marked with a small green dot, you know, in the sidebar. And... Um, um, unfortunately, I mean, not, not unfortunately, of course, but uh, for the first update, you will have to do it manually. And then every next one, you know, will be uh, done automatically in a way. So uh, the, the updates will be rolled out uh, automatically, but you will be prompted if you are on Mac and on Windows, 
you'll be prompted to quit and restart with the loose, you know. And if you're on a Linux operational system, then you will be uh, able to update, well, completely automatically, you know, the, the, the app will restore, it will restart itself. So I understand the flight, the flight release, I understand there's going to be two releases in very quick succession. Ultimately, the first yes. one contains the code that's going to provide the functionality. And then the second one, if you like, is, is the test of it. And then once all that's done, we're in business. Precisely, yes. So the first one is the support for automatic updates. And once we have the support, then we can roll out as many automatic updates as we want. So we'll drop the... Uh, the website address for the Daedalus Flight page so that people can access that when it's ready. Of course, remember, only use the official Daedalus pages to download your wallet. Yeah, but we'll, yes. we'll drop that link in there, and uh, we hope everyone will try that out. Yes, and it's also important to mention that these automatic updates are verified through various autonomous sources, so it's completely secure, and you needn't worry about anything regarding your, uh, your machines, basically, your PCs. That's right. So I was just going to say, Darko is actually sick and he's out today, but he's putting together a video that's going to accompany the release that's that's upcoming for the flights that everybody's going to see. And the other big thing I wanted to talk about was Smash. I know there's been some discussions in the community forum about uh, what we are doing with that. It is in beta because Smash is actually in a service. It's a policy and it's also a feature, in my opinion. So there's a lot that underlines um, how we would list and delist certain tickers and, and how we would help the brand building for stick pull operators. So that's something else that's coming out in uh, in our release. And uh, we'll have some introductory guidelines and, and how stick pull operators can actually go about utilizing it or putting a, or, or getting onto a delist or getting onto a green list. Or we'll, we'll explain more of that in, in another video as well. So we're we're going to be rolling that also in out in, in flight this week. Correct. Okay. And then um, for the community, Philip has actually been our product lead for hardware wallets, along with being the business analyst for Deadless and Adrestia. So he's got a lot on his plate. And we've been working exclusively with the Vacuum Labs on the hardware wallet support with Ledger and Trezor. So Philip, why don't you give our audience kind of an update on where we are with that and, and what's next? Sure. Thanks, Aparna. So this is one big feature we have been planning for a couple of months right now. Uh, we want to provide uh, option, an option for our stake pool operators and stake pool owners, of course, to uh, delegate and uh, basically pledge their uh, you know, stake more securely using hardware. So hardware is more, more precisely Ledger and Trezor. So we've been working with Vacuum Labs for a bit more than a month now in uh, you know, providing this experience to them. Um, and also one big chunk of that work also is uh, the ability to delegate to multiple pools. Uh, so from one wallet to, mul to multiple pools, more than one pool. So we, ho we hope that th those, uh, uh, let's say, features will also be released in the next couple of months. Uh, they are pretty big. We unfortunately we also you know depend on Trezor Ledger Guide, but we have a great relationship with them, and I have no uh, doubt that it will be rolled out without many problems. Let's put it like that. If, if we said any, that would be you know an ideal world, but let's say that you know uh, without many problems. So uh, hopefully we'll have it also in general supported in, in one of the next releases. Uh, by the end of the year, I hope as well, uh, for sure. So, uh, you know, uh, I feel very excited uh, to have the community know once it's rolled out and, you know, we'll definitely be organizing more focus groups for SPOs and other community members to see how these features are validated and if they are more acceptable in these or that, let's say, form. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And Tim, you know, that's one of the things you and I were talking about. How do we get more focused focus groups, if you may, running community yeah. events around delegators and stake pool operators? The delegation piece, that's a huge piece from Hardware Wallets. We're going to we're going to try to redo that also one to one parity in Deadless as much as possible. So we have a delegation center of some sort there. And we're doing the same things around Catalyst. And I know I'm bringing in some of the other aspects here, but Deadless is going to be one of those products that can evolve to take a couple of these centers for stake pool operators and delegators in general. So that's, this is one of the first pieces. So thank you, Philip, for managing that and uh, doing a good job. And we're looking forward to, to seeing that in the product. No problem. I look forward to having more updates. Right. Thanks, Philip.
All right. So we just caught up with uh, Philip on the Daedalus segment. So going into another aspect of Shelley that we were focusing on, but we needed to have before we went into Gogan, it's it's around metadata. And metadata also enables Cardano to start looking at itself as a utility platform for uh, partnerships and for commercial applications and, and proof of concepts and all the exciting stuff that makes it usable in the future. So Tim, you caught up with uh, Denal as well as with Alan on a couple of the the POCs that they've been working on, right? That's right. Alan's been uh, the solutions architect who's been uh, looking at this. And Danelle, obviously, some of you know uh, from Atala Prism, but he's also been working on some of these partnerships. So, Alan, Danelle, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, and maybe let's just start off with an explainer, Alan. Perhaps you can just tell us what is metadata? So, um, in the beginning, developers wanted to leverage the fact that the blockchain was a permanent uh, record. So with the Bitcoin blockchain, they wanted to put little bits of data on there because they knew they would be available forever. Um, so they eventually it was supported officially with um, op return, which allowed you to add 80 or 40 bytes of data um, onto the blockchain and there it would stay. So you fast forward to sort of our third generation blockchain and the principle is the same you can add uh, data and have it permanently available on the blockchain so it's a permanent attestation um, of the data and so you can do that in a, in a couple of ways you can add the data directly or for very large amounts of data you can create a merkle tree out of this data and put the root hash of the merkle tree onto the blockchain so then um, you can offer proofs that that data existed at a specific point in time in the past and and, and um, those proofs will will stand up to scrutiny. And so uh, there's a lot of different sort of use cases. People are very imaginative about this, but uh, probably the one that's most widely talked about is, is supply chain. Um, and I, I find that one quite interesting because if you have like a multiple, if you have multiple uh, different authorities um, who sort of have orthogonal interests like uh, customs clearance and suppliers and delivery people, and they're all providing attestations that are interlinked on a binary level, then you're creating a picture of a supply chain that's that's very, very hard to argue with. So how specifically will this work on Cardano? How have you implemented this? Well, in Cardano, um, the size of the transaction data, or rather the size of the metadata that you're able to put uh, on the blockchain is significantly more than what the, the guys had to work with in the beginning. So um, you can use all of the transaction size, which is currently about 16K, minus the size of the rest of the transaction, which is the UTXOs, the inputs and the outputs. So roughly you can depend on about 8K bytes uh, that you can place on the uh, on the blockchain at any time. And so in the professional services group, what we like to do is take this raw technology and package it up package it up rather in a way that's useful for uh, different clients use cases. So in this case, we've created a gRPC uh, service that wraps the wallet interaction, that gives you low wallet balance alarms um, and various other bits and pieces, and then puts that into a, a simple uh, Docker container and gives you a single interface that you can just fire your metadata at the blockchain. Um, and wait until it's buried under the number, the requisite number of blocks that you've asked for, um, and and it just takes away uh, all of the, uh, the 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 mess, and we'll say with uh, wallets. So, Alan, I think you've got a good, got a demo you can show us in a, a moment. Maybe just while you're setting that up, Janelle, let's turn to you for a moment. So, Alan mentioned use cases. You've been busy developing Atala, all the suite of products there since we heard about it at the summit. Perhaps you want to give us a bit of an update and, and how that fits in with metadata. Yeah, sure. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the Atala suite is progressing really well. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, we're currently focusing on uh, completing the Cardano integration. So um, for that, metadata was the missing functionality. Uh, we've got that now. Um, uh, from, from a Prism perspective, at least the team is aiming to be uh, ready with that integration, uh, sort of mid uh, to, to end October. Um, you know, we, we're using metadata in a number of different ways across the different applications. Uh, from a Prism perspective, um, the metadata is being used uh, for the DIDs um, and also associated DID documents. So those are stored on the Cardano blockchain. 
Um, you also have um, schemas um, and credential definitions so for the different uh, types of credentials you create, like certificates and birth records and so on. Those schemas are stored on the blockchain, but none of the personal identifiable information is stored on the blockchain. Um, we also have uh, revocation registries. So um, if someone, that, say a university issues a certificate and they decide to revoke it, um, you need to have a place where you know everyone has um, um, one version of the truth. Um, so we're also using metadata for that. So if a university needs to revoke um, a credential, that's recorded and um, you know the rest of the applications can then uh, know that particular status. Um, you know, when it re relates to the other two Atala products, so Atala Trace and Atala Scan, um, they're also using metadata to record tamper-proof uh, supply chain records. So, Alan, perhaps let's just have a quick look. Uh, perhaps you can share your screen and we'll have a look at it in action. Sure. Okay. Hopefully you're looking at a screen with some with a metadata service proto. Uh, so this is the uh, GRPC uh, proto interface. And I'm showing you this to begin with because as a developer, this is your first port of call, call rather. And so you can see that the met metadata service has just a single uh, submit metadata uh, with a request and returns a stream of these responses. And so in the uh, metadata request, you have your metadata. You provide the depth that you want the transaction to be buried under. So for finality, you may want it buried under 10 transactions, under two, sorry, under 10 blocks or two blocks. Uh, so you specify that here. <clears throat> your client ID basically indicates which wallet that you um, that you want to use. And then the transaction ID is for is for failures and restarts, where you already have a transaction ID. Uh, but let me just shoot over and show you the um, the code which was going to call this. So this is a simple um, Scala client, uh, and it generates the client from that proto that we just looked at. And it's important to note that there are client generators for all the languages. So there are client generators for Python, there are client generators for uh, JavaScript, and so on. So you can put this, uh, you can use this uh, service from any of those supported languages. So this is a very simple client, but it's written in Scala. Um, you create your client here, you create a simple uh, map of, of uh, test metadata, and then you submit the request to the service. And for every response in the stream, you just literally print it out and then um, and wait for the result. So let's fire it up. So the first response contains the transaction state pending. Uh, and so does the second. And so what we're waiting for now is for this state to become uh, in ledger. So now the state has switched to in ledger. And this here specifies the number of blocks that this transaction is buried under. So currently it's buried under uh, zero blocks. And then you also have some information around uh, the block that it went into and so on. And I'll just show that the, the number of blocks that we're waiting for it to be buried under is uh, two, as specified here in the request. So, Alan, so, this uh, this functionality is going to really sort of open up to the whole developer community, I imagine. When when can we start expecting to see this? Well, this this service is part of uh, of the professional services um, group. Uh, so, really, if you want to uh, get in touch and and use this, you can email us at enterprise.solutions at iohk.io. Uh, but I can also talk about a, a jar that wraps the, um, the Cardano wallet backend API, which this, this depends on. Uh, just, for just to um, let you know, this is now finished. And you can see that it's buried under, um, it's buried under two blocks. Uh, and so that is now successfully uh, on the blockchain. You can, you can retrieve it. It's on, the, it's on the testnet blockchain. You can retrieve it through the, um, through the uh, TXID. Uh, but uh, as part of the development of this, we also developed a Scala stroke Java uh, wrapper, a, a jar that will wrap the REST API that the uh, Cardano node uses. So it allows you to do all the things like uh, check the network information, uh, post a transaction, um, and also, of course, post, post metadata. So we expect to release that um, 
probably possibly this week probably probably next week that will be an early version of that and so we're quite pleased about that because that puts uh, a very simple way to interact with your cardano node into the hands of um of java and scala developers great and Danelle, obviously the um lots of work going on behind the scenes in the professional services group and within your team with new partnerships and developer outreach any update on when we can expect a bit more news there um, certainly, uh, I mean, we have a very lively uh, pipeline at the moment. Uh, we've got over 30 potential opportunities uh, that we're looking at from, from a prism perspective. Um, the team are prioritizing uh, some of those. Um, so we hope to announce um, at least a few of those over the next month or two. Um, the team's also working towards uh, a demo um, uh, for the Georgian government. Um, so we'll be showing a few more bits that uh, we haven't shown or we didn't show at the summit. Uh, for example, at the summit, uh, people got to see what the app looks like, but um, we've also built management consoles that can be used to um, you know, create credentials, uh, manage uh, user groups um, and so on. And um, also a browser wallet that manages um, keys um, that enable people to access uh, this management console. So. Um, once we've got this demo ready for the Georgian government, I uh, would love to also show that to, to the community to see the progress uh, we've made and um, you know, would like to also progress with the Georgian uh, government to a full-blown pilot. Um, and um, yeah, as mentioned, there's a few others in, in the works, um, testing out different ways um, that um, uh, the community and businesses will be able to, to work with us as a team. So we'll share a few more, more of those details in uh, the October update. Um, so in addition to that, um, uh, just in metadata in general, we'll be hosting a session in October uh, for developers that are interested in creating their own solutions to, to leverage metadata. So you can look out uh, for that as well. Fantastic. Great. Okay, Danelle, Alan, thank you both very much. Cheers. Okay, so decentralized governance is another one of those areas that we are uh, we are forwarding with full momentum while we're doing everything else. And just last week, we launched Fund2 with uh, Project Catalyst, which has been quite an exciting trajectory so far. And Tim, you caught up with our main guy, Dor, around this. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we've had a fantastic response to the to the program so far. It's a little over a week into Fund2, and, and there's been remarkable response, really. So, yeah, I caught up with Dor and also two of the community members, uh, James and Maria, who were part of Fund1, which, of course, was the, the prototyping, I suppose, of the summer, which has allowed us to, to move so quickly on this area. So let's have a look at that now. So, Dor, uh, James, Maria, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us on the show today. It's been, it's been a busy week. In Project Catalyst Central, hasn't it? It's uh, not only Fund One still going on, but the launch of Fund Two just over a week on now. Dor, perhaps we just want to start, and you want to give us a little bit of a little bit of an intro to where we are and what we've achieved in just one week. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an amazing week. I'm really excited uh, with with all the involvement. So as you can see, um, we basically. 5x what what was our initial expectations uh, for the first week of fund two we were expecting people to share maybe 100 perspectives we got to 516 uh, we got more than 2000 comments um, and here this number says uh, 1860 members but right now we have a lot like more than 2000 people uh, registered in id scale um, we also have like around more than 500 people on our announcement channel, uh, around 200 people in the chat. Uh, I think in almost like 200 people, maybe even more in the community started Discord channel. Uh, we can see that uh, we had contributions from 55 countries around the world. We are a truly global, global organization and we're basically one of the most diverse and large decentralized innovation funds in the blockchain space and we did it in one week another another thing is we surveyed the users like who you know who are you guys the community and and just looking at these numbers you can you can really see the the potential and what we can do together like we have you know more than you know more than 617 entrepreneurs more than 413 developers 250 stakeholder operators 
124 teachers, 122 marketing professionals, 80 community managers. Can you imagine what we can achieve together if we just work together and coordinate and learn how to make smart decisions? And this is exactly what we've, we're doing. And I think our pace of learning is uh, almost breaknaking, breaknaking, neck, sorry, neck breaking speed. Uh, so it's really exciting and we're going with a lot of momentum into, into the, the second week of, of uh, FAN2. Brilliant, Dor. Thank you. And Dor, you know, I mean, I think your, um, your passion and your enthusiasm for the project is, is a massive part of why we got here so quickly and it's certainly pretty infectious. And uh, joining us, obviously, Maria and James, you're two of the community members who've helped us set things up during Fund One. We're very keen to get you on today just to give a little bit of, little bit of your perspective on what the journey so far has been like. But perhaps before we do that, perhaps Maria, you'd just like to sort of introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved with Cardano originally. Hello guys, my name is Maria Carmo. I'm a Cardano ambassador, SPO, and also a teacher. And I got involved in Cardano about uh, with the ambassadorship. I want to be involved and get my hands on, and I'm here and also part of the Catalyst. James, over to you. Perhaps you want to just give yourself a little brief introduction. Thanks, Tim. My name is James. Um, I am a teacher. I've, I first got interested in Cardano back in 2017. Like a lot of people, I saw Charles's video. And from day one, the idea of smart contracts is really where my interest started. I was like, wow, that, that idea is going to change the world. Um, so it's really exciting to be here and see it rolling out in real time. So obviously Fund One was the first part of the experience and the first part of the journey. James, being part of that original experience, what, what's, what's some of the things that you've learned from that so far? You know, I mean, I think a lot of us are bringing similar ideas. We're all orbiting each other with the ideas we're bringing to the table. Um, and so it's really cool uh, to, to, to see the power of collaboration, to see the way that one person's ideas might draw another person out and, and into a new space. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's worth it just to continue looking for those opportunities to collaborate because you never know what you might learn. So Maria, from your perspective, what have, what, what's been the most interesting part of the experiment so far? I love our um, leadership. He's always there for you, always. I love, I always say, I, I am sitting on the shoulder of giants. Everyone there is a giant. They have experience in business. They have experience in life. They will hold you by the hand and lead you the way you want to go. I have my meters on the train, you know, come from work. And, but they, if I have any doubt and I have any questions, they will be there for you. Is the really meaning of community. I didn't know what community was until I got into Catalyst. Mm -hmm. So Maria, actually being part of that kind of initial cohort, that initial group, you've almost taken on an additional responsibility for yourself. What, what advice would you give to some of the people who are now coming through who've been in the experience for a week with, with Fun One? What, what, what experience would you share with them particularly? I would say, don't be shy. If you have a good idea, just come forward and we are here to help you and to lead you the way. We need more programs because this is the, the challenge to bring more programs to the Cardano and I'll be here for you. Don't be afraid, we are here. And James, how about you? What advice would you give to all the noobs coming through? I would say stay open, uh, be, be really open to the ideas that everyone's bringing because you never know where inspiration is going to come from. So Dor, we're only we're only two funds in, but this one is going to run for a while, isn't it? Perhaps you just want to give us a bit of an update of what we can expect to see next from the, uh, from the program and Project Catalyst. Yeah, so we, entered, we have entered the idea submission stage. So uh, that started Wednesday and it's going to end on Wednesday at uh, basically 12 noon uh, PST time, Pacific Central time. And that, and that uh, so that's like your final chance to submit your proposal and basically take part in this community-driven incubation process that helps you make an awesome proposal. Um, another thing you can see is we have, um, so, so already we have 56 submissions in the system. Um, and we already have uh, probably more than 100 requests for, for help. So people have been using the tags in ID scale to say I seek a blockchain developer, I seek a designer, I seek a marketer, I seek business advice, 
I seek someone to help me write my proposal. So it's, it's there. So, so for now, it's like not just about uh, submitting proposals, but it's also for if, if, if you're not leading a proposal, it's also for you to check out all the different opportunities for you to, to be an implementer. So implementer also, win, also, also takes uh, part of the quarter million dollars of, of rewards. So I hope uh, people take this opportunity and we form great teams. And that quarter of a million dollars, of course, isn't necessarily going to just one idea. It, it effectively could fund a multitude of ideas from a multitude of people in their own little sort of collaboration groups. Exactly. It's, it's, it's in the end, it's in the end of the community to decide how the, how the, the funds are going to be distributed. If, you know, we're picking like a few large size projects or like many small size projects or anything in between. And people who are doing the voting themselves, I understand through a voting app that James and Maria and some of the original group have actually been trying out and testing. There's a voting app and people actually get rewarded for voting itself. Is that right? Yeah, 20% of, 20 of, the, of, of funding goes to, goes to the voters as a voter incentive. So, Dor, there's going to be another, another town hall, uh, which is the regular weekly meetings around Project Catalyst. There'll be one very shortly after tonight's show, I believe. Um, perhaps you just want to give a bit of a preview of what people can expect to see in that if they'd like to join. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's going to be a particularly exciting town hall because we're going to uh, double down and talk about uh, voting registration. How do you register to vote? How do you actually exercise your, your power as a member of the Cardano community to, to make these funding decisions? And we're going to talk about the new phase, about the refinement phase, and how we're going to help uh, proposers make the best proposals possible and support them. And this, this, I, I, I can't share it right now, but I also have like a really big news to share about the new, a potential new collaboration we're working with. So I would, I would recommend you guys to, to tune in. It's going to be an interesting one. James, Maria, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck with everything. In fact, why don't we give you a chance? We've got, uh, we've got a minute left. Why don't we give you 30 seconds each? Let's hear about your individual ideas as well. If you fancy giving us just a quick 30 second pitch, I'll, I'll set my timer. James, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I have a proposal up called Cardano Starter Kits, which are for now uh, education opportunities for people who want to get involved with Cardano. Um, specifically, I'm targeting people who might not be developers yet, but who might want to be able to dip their toes in there. Longer term, these education materials are going to lead us towards um, community implementation. So just projects that get Cardano into the hands of end users, people who might not be interested in the tech, but who, who really want to see what the new tech can do. Um, so my goal is to make people say, wow, uh, how'd you do that? And can you tell me more? James, thank you. That was a little over 30 seconds, but worth it. Maria, how about you? <laughs> uh, I do have a proposal for a podcast. It's called uh, Love Lens uh, Academy. And I'm a teacher. I'm here to help bring new developers to the system. So we're going to be delivering uh, episodes every week. And I continue to look after for my ideas there. Maria, thank you, and good luck with that. And also good luck to everybody else who's put an idea forwards on the platform. If people want to go and look at that, it's the Idea Scale platform. Um, so we're sharing the link now, so you can go and have a look at some of the ideas that have been submitted. Maybe it'll inspire some of you to get involved as well. But meanwhile, Maria, James, and of course, Dor, thank you very much, and we'll see you again soon. Okay, so um, Project Catalyst, a hive of activity and creativity and indeed future development for Cardano. And of course, we talked at the outset of the show, Aparna, about that developer experience and how that was part of uh, the, the overall Gogan rollout and a core part of the experience for, uh, for a developer community. So you caught up with Mariam from the CF to talk a little bit about that, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Mariam's the, uh, the marketing lead over at the CF, and they've been doing an extremely good job of beefing up their capabilities around onboarding and outreach and marketing and communications for, for Cardano. So it was quite exciting to sit down with her and, and chat a little bit about the developer portal and, and where they're headed with that. So why don't we roll the clip? Yeah, let's have a look now. Mariam, thanks for joining us on uh, today's show. Uh, community, Mariam is the marketing leader for the CF. 
and she is joining us today to talk a little bit about Gogan's marketing and what the CF is doing in terms of uh, Gogan developer acquisition and onboarding and some of the work that's already being put out um, by the CF team. So we're really happy to have this collaboration with the CF and we're hoping to bring a lot more people from the CF into the show, as, especially as we go through Gogan and Voltaire and, and so on and so forth. So I'm excited to have Mariam on the show. So Mariam, for anybody that doesn't know you, because you've already kind of been introduced through the CF side, but for, for our viewership, just a quick uh, hello and uh, what you do and uh, why are you excited to be working on this? Thanks, Aparna. I um, appreciate being on the show today. Uh, my name is Mariam. I've been working in marketing for about 17 years now, so it's been a minute. Um, I focus very heavily on healthcare, uh, and healthcare database management, especially uh, in my past roles. So uh, very much on the technology side, um, doing product marketing and uh, corporate marketing for various companies across uh, the healthcare uh, platform. And then I joined Consensus, um, uh, then joining the CF, uh, it's been since May. Uh, so the transition to blockchain has definitely been interesting, but there's a lot of, I think, uh, uh, parallel ideas and uh, continuations of theories of how uh, data should be managed and how uh, you know uh, data should uh, be uh, not just across person to person or you know company to company, uh, but how data needs to be treated as an entire system uh, and how we have to look at it as an entire platform versus. Know, what my needs are versus what your needs are. Right. I mean, there's a lot of work on on your side, on the Cardano Foundation side, for the adoption and the marketing of the platform itself. And you know, we just kind of finished up with Shelley, so that's it's it's somewhat brand new. But Gogan opens up a whole new opportunity, right, in terms of the utility of the platform. So when it comes to a user acquisition bit, for example, the community acquisition, and then the marketing of that to be able to push uh, Gogan and then Cardano's name out in the market. Um, you have been working, and I've, I've seen some of the work, and it's been great. You know, this collaboration has been great. But the, you've been working on a roadmap and milestones and being able to do this for user acquisition. So I would love for you to share some of those insights uh, on the show. Sure. So because of the functionality of Gogan and really focusing on the developer capabilities, we really want to uh, introduce, segment and create a entire community within a community for developers. So uh, to do that, one, you know, obviously we're looking to acquire new uh, developers. You know, um, the community is made up of a broad spectrum of them. We're trying to identify uh, those uh, existing in our community, but also draw in new developers into our uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we're also working on building a developer portal. This is going to be sort of a one-stop shop for our developers. You know, we want them to be able to come in, first of all, be able to onboard and uh, get training on uh, Gogan, Plutus, Marlow, you know, uh, everything that they really need to know to get up and running easily. We want to make that process as easy and comfortable as possible for our devs. Uh, the other part of it is to be able to collaborate and contribute. So, you know, uh, there are so many great projects happening within the community. We want people to be able to showcase these projects, you know, to be able to source uh, other people to come in and collaborate with them, you know, networking opportunities, but also uh, not just with each other, but the community at large. So, you know, what are the major things, having job boards? Uh, having a place to come in and uh, share your profile and who you are, and, uh, really creating uh, a, a dynamic and uh, I would say two-way or more relationship uh, across uh, the community itself. So it's not just us pushing out materials. It's not just us stating, you know, here's what you need. It's the community uh, also uh, contributing and collaborating with us and with each other. That's that's really exciting, and it's a very dynamic portal. And you know, I've talked a little bit about you in the past about this vision um, that you're trying to achieve with this. So, for for our audience today, when can they start playing around with this, or when they can can they start seeing some development around this rollout? 
So uh, right now, as we're doing the acquisition and we do have a landing page where people can sign up for the portal and um, they'll also start receiving exclusive content. So every couple of weeks, we'll be sending out materials relevant to Govin, Plutus, Marlowe, tokenization. You know, uh, we want to keep that relationship going while we're building out the portal. And their answers to that form will also help us really uh, decide which, uh, you know, uh, features to focus on heavily at first. So it is going to be a phased rollout. We plan on launching, uh, you know, early 2021. So, uh, you know, people will have access to all the onboarding materials, some of the collaboration parts. And then, uh, you know, towards the end of the first quarter, they'll be able to have the full access of the site. Uh, That's great. So, so it is a phased rollout. So how do, how do community members right now get involved, Miriam? Can they email you or email someone at the CF if they've got suggestions or anything like that? Yes. Um, I mean, uh, we listen on all of our socials. So if you're on any of our social media, please, by all means, submit your ideas there. You can email us at marketing at cardanofoundation.com. The entire marketing team receives that. Um, you know, or just to sort of elaborate on how much focus we're really putting on this developer community. When I joined uh, the, the Cardano Foundation, PR and marketing were first uh, aligned as one team. Uh, with my coming on, marketing uh, was to become its own department. And on Monday, we will be having our fourth team member. So we're growing quite rapidly, uh, considering uh, the size, uh, you know, and this, uh, uh, the short amount of time. So we're really putting a heavy focus on uh, providing uh, the community the marketing uh, materials that they really need and the content that they need. And uh, so we want that feedback. So, uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, through socials, through the email address, the uh, contact form on the Cardano website is another great tool. You know, uh, I'm always on there. I respond to suggestions provided all the time. So, uh, you know, please reach out. That's great. And, and, and yes, absolutely. The team is growing pretty quickly and you're segmenting it, you know, as the need comes in, um, it, it grows really. But there's one more thing, right? So on top of the marketing and the developer onboarding, there's also the partnership angle of it. And um, Miriam, you, you, I know we don't have the partnership people here, but there are partnerships that are being worked on at the CF that we can share more of in, in, the, in the future, correct? Yes, we have a team dedicated specifically to partnerships. Um, we also have a new head of growth coming in to really oversee a growing uh, the community across various platforms and partnerships is a very big part of that. So, you know, uh, Ava, who we've been announcing across all of our socials the past little while, she'll be joining us um, in less than a week. And, you know, she's already hit the ground running. We've had a bunch of calls on uh, uh, how to proceed and projects uh, to work on. Uh, so partnerships is a huge part for us and we will have some really big news uh, in the very near future. Absolutely. But I won't steal Jeremy Thunder and I'll let him <laughs> share all yeah. that. That's right, Jeremy. We'll definitely bring Jeremy on the show uh, next month as well because we've got some exciting partnerships to discuss uh, during that time. So thanks, Miriam. I, I appreciate that. It sounds like you guys are, are really ro you're rolling quickly and that's you in the direction with us on Gogan. So we are pretty excited about this collaboration with the foundation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here on the show and uh, looking forward to, to working with you more in the future as well. Thank you very much. I as well. So thanks for staying with us, everybody. Uh, a bumper show, as we said, but we've still got lots more to go. Remember, we're streaming live on YouTube and we're here right now on Crowdcast, but we'll put some links in after the event. So if you want to deep dive into some of the specific areas that are most interesting to you, you can go straight in there. So that was great, Aparna, to hear um, about the developer experience from a portal perspective and an information perspective and how we're going to be making that available. But of course, one of the other areas where developers are going to be able to access these new services is through the playgrounds. Absolutely. And, you know, and I caught up with Marlowe because their playground is uh, is one of the things that's a little more advanced. And Marlowe is a domain specific language. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with Simon, Mike and Shruti, who are the leads for Marlowe. 
Um, the piece about Marla that I really like is it has a ton of potential for the domain specific world. So wherever contracts are going to become a part of the natural order of the blockchain, uh, financial areas for DeFi, legal areas, for example, it could even flow into real estate. And there's so many applications and so many ways this can go. So Marlo is interesting and, and love to share some more with you and, and uh, in this show as well as in the upcoming shows as well. So let's, uh, let's take a look at, at Simon, Mike and Shruti. Hello, Marlo team. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Barna. <laughs> really excited to have you guys on the show today. So for the community, Gogan is technically about the multi-asset ledger and the smart contract capability. Uh, however, from a market endpoint, it's really around platform utility. That's that's the that's the main goal. Uh, Byron and Shelley gave a gave Cardano the foundations to build this usability, which to me is is kind of a clear indicator of platform viability in the long term. And Plutus, in in terms of the Gogan um, era, brings that to Cardano by allowing the decentralized app ecosystem to flourish. Uh, Marlow takes it a step further. And uh, to me, Marlowe really expands the context of platform utility while also specializing the functionality of it to allow for that, that, uh, that usability to happen. So I'm actually thrilled to introduce these guys uh, to the community. And on the last show, we had small clips from uh, Shruti and Mike to introduce themselves. And most everybody on the show, I'm sure, have, have seen Simon and his presentations as our tech lead and research lead for, for Marlowe. But in case anybody missed that, let's do a quick run through uh, from your leads here and kind of what excites them about Marlowe. So why don't we start with Shruti, then go on to Simon, and then um, wrap it up with Mike on the intro. Shruti? Hello, folks. Um, I did an intro last time as well, but I'm Shruti Apia, and I'm the product manager for Marlowe. I'm very excited to work on this product, especially because it has so many capabilities that bring financial instruments onto the blockchain. And I'm super excited to work on this and talk to you guys more about it. Hi, so I'm Simon Thompson. I'm the tech lead on Marlowe. I, it's with, with Pablo Lamello, we developed Marlowe, and we've been working with a bigger team since then to bring all the, all the features that we have and what we'll be doing today is showing you the Marlowe Playground. And I think that's one of the things that I, I'm most excited about, building this language, but then putting it in a form where we can get it in front of the Cardano community and get your feedback on what we're doing. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm a UX and a UI designer. And uh, what really excites me about Marlowe is it's really it's the simplicity. We're making it easy for anyone who's interested in programming to just have a go. and. Uh, it's not complicated. You can just log on and click away and, and we're going to ex expand it and build it into um, a really fun thing to use for people. It, it, it's designed not to be intimidating, just to be inviting. So um, I can't wait till you use it. Use it. I, I love I love that line because that's a whole it's a big part of our products. You know, it's one of those things that I keep talking about when I first came on and how do we make blockchain usable for the general public, not just the, the specialists out there. And I think we're doing a really good job by bringing in product managers that are really attuned to our community and listening to the community, as well as product UX designers that are, are looking at how the workflows happen and how people like to, to use things. And um, so just in that vein, you know, one of the things we do is before any product, we, we like to figure out what it, the product is, who is it for, you know, why is this important for us? And, and Shruti has done a good job of putting that canvas together. So Shruti, let's start with that brass tax. Let's go to Marlo. What is Marlo? Who is it for? Why does it matter? Give, give the community a little insight into that. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about the history of Marlo as well. Marlo actually started three years ago when Charles and Simon got together and realized that functional programming languages are were actually really good fit for application in finance and to build out financial instruments because they are so strict and they, you are able to test and formally verify contracts very easily. That brings about a ton of security to smart contracts. And as a result of that, we're able to have much more secure as well as complete smart contracts. And in regards to that, we have a three-pronged strategy for Marlowe. We're rolling out a Marlowe OSS, the open source version for developers, and as well as Marlowe for enterprise. 
which is the enterprise product that's going to build out customized use cases for enterprises, as well as model for end users product, which really aims to drive adoption on Cardano network. Great, thanks. Yes, yeah, so Marlo, is, uh, is, we'll talk a little bit more about the strategy and, and um, the community will hear about this through subsequent shows as well. But we really had to take a step back from uh, what Marlo was originally intended for and widen, uh, widen it so that, um, because, because it's actually capable of doing so much more than just the financial piece. There's a lot more that can come into play here, which is one thing that's really exciting about the product. So at the core of it though, it is a domain specific language. So Simon, in this concept of specialization or domain specific languages, what are your thoughts on that? And, and how does it help propagate uh, smart contract adoption in the ecosystem? I mean, I think it's, it, you need to think about when you, when you write a computer program, most of the time, most, most programming environments ask you to think like the computer. Whereas what you do with a domain specific language is you get the computer to accept the language of the user. So you have a language, you program the contracts in language that a financial expert or somebody who knows enough about finance will understand. So you're thinking in terms of payments, of time evolving, of um, users making choices, there being information coming from outside the contract, like an oracle. But those are things which are in the world of finance. They're not about while loops or about interrupts or whatever. So the hardware you don't see, the software you don't see, you just think in terms of the contract itself. Um, and I think this is something that people have, you can see these through the development of, of computing over the last 30 years or so, that there's been a, a whole trend for doing this kind of thing in CAD and in finance as well. And this is one reason we wanted to look at, at um, finance, particularly on blockchain, because there'd been very successful domain spe specific languages in the financial sector before that. So we see it's a very good place to try a DSL, but also it's like the canary in the coal mine for what a DSL might look like on blockchain. So we can have a DSL for finance, but we can think of building DSLs in other areas, such as supply chain or asset management. Um, whatever you might think of putting on blockchain, you, there will often be a language there which would emerge and would allow people the easiest access possible to, to working with blockchain in that domain. You know, that's a great point. And, and you know, when you're talking about finance itself, since Marlowe was specific to the financial contract space, you're talking about years of contracts that are written in traditional systems and legacy systems and, and how people are doing it today, status quo. So what would you, Simon, and then Shruti as well, say is the biggest differentiator about Marlowe when it comes to comparing and contrasting against systems like that? Well, I think, first of all, when you write, I mean, a lot of contracts are written in, in English or, or other natural language. So there's a huge amount of ambiguity there. So having a language where you can write contracts that are still readable, but are, are unambiguous, that's a, that's a big step. I think because the language is, is more specific, it, it's just designed to, to, um, to, to write financial contracts. We can build in certain good things by design. And we can eliminate bad things. We can, for example, every Marlowe contract, you can guarantee that by the end of the contract, all the money that has been tied, all the assets that have been tied up in it will be released to the participants. A contract can't keep your money forever. And you can read that off from the, you can read off how long the contract will live just, just from the way it's written. So there's no trickery there. Whereas reading a general something written in, in Solidity, say, it's much harder. I mean, it's, it's not possible in general to give that guarantee. And it's much harder to see if a Solidity contract would give you that kind of, that kind of guarantee. So some things are ruled out. What we can also do, because it's a simpler language, we can do things like static analysis. We can, without running the contract, work out all the different ways that contract could behave and check, for example, that it won't make a failed payment on any of those possible execution paths. So we can give very strong guarantees of contract will always terminate, it will always do what it should do, and it will always make full payments, for example. And that you just don't get with a general, a general programming language. And you know, also from a more business perspective, <laughs> I would like to um, also allude to the fact that how Marlowe is able to solve certain problems 
which are uniquely solved by blockchain. And this is only able to do able to be possible because of the fact that we are able to express these financial instruments on something that will operate on blockchain. So there are certain problems in the financial industry that will be uniquely solved or made more mm -hmm. efficient or less expensive using the blockchain. And with Marlow, we're able to replicate financial instruments, especially with DeFi these days being quite popular and be able to you know, run those contracts as well as create entire financial instruments and um, have an explore of the efficiencies of that. And with regards to how we want to use Marlow to also facilitate adoption of Cardano, is we really want to explore how we can broaden our user base. And to, to achieve that, we want to bring in developers that are not just Haskell developers, but we want to expand beyond Haskell developers to also people who, who only might know on JavaScript and be able to have them develop smart contracts on our JavaScript editor as well as our um, other editors that we have using Blockly for visual programming on the playground. And that's huge, right, Shruti? I mean, if you think about it, like our, our mission statement with, with Cardano itself is around the economic inclusion and an identity uh, for all in a way. So this particular product in finance and being able to do this and bring in the type of uh, users we're wanting to adopt onto the platform definitely allows for that, for that propagation of that mission statement. So this is uh, this is definitely a special product um, for for our portfolio, and you know speaking of that, when we're rolling out Marlow, for for example, you know Gogan is not just a Plutus or just Marlow. It's it's kind of a collection of of these of these smart contracting capabilities, and it hasn't been sequential. And, and um, like like we've talked about at the beginning of the show and all that, we we work on Voltaire, we work on Gogan, we work on different aspects of blockchain infrastructure as well um, so it's not one after the other in terms of a rollout to the to the community so marlow also has a rollout strategy and it has been working in parallel with uh, the plutus and working in parallel with some of the other components of cardano so shruti why don't you talk about the strategy for the rollout strategy for marlow you kind of alluded a little bit to how we're segmenting the product itself but how are we looking at it from a rollout and a community engagement aspect yeah, so for 2020 and 2021, we're really focusing on Marlow OS, OS, OSS or open source for developers. Mm -hmm. And with regards to that, um, we are looking to do a lot of more developer engagement and seeing how we can actually build out a really flushed out smart contract library in a way that will be useful to end users as well. And with regards to that, we also have Marlow for Enterprises. And this product is really meant for more traditional finance. And we are doing, we're in the very early exploratory stages for Marlow for Enterprises. And we're looking for people to talk to. We want, we want some subject matter experts to really start a dialogue around what are the key problems that they face in the financial industry that can be made more efficient using blockchain, right? And so along with that, um, we are also developing Marlow for end users, which is essentially a platform where you can execute smart contracts without having to bother with actually building them out. So having a very flushed out large smart contract library, it's a very automatic extension of that, right? And this end users product is ultimately going to drive adoption of Cardano because it allows such a wide subset of people to be able to use smart contract technology. And so with regards to that, we have also at the end of October, we're going to be releasing the first Marlow Playground. Um, and that's going to be our Marlow Playground Alpha. And for that, we're looking for um, groups of testers and pioneers who will be willing to test out the playground, let us know the features that they like and the features that they would like to see improvements on. And for Marlow for Enterprises, we're also looking for subject matter experts with whom we can start dialogues around for what they are looking for in certain financial instruments that they want to be seeing built on the blockchain. So far, we are exploring things such as contracts for difference, escrow contracts, and principal and surety contracts, and many other such contracts. But we really want to expand it even further and also expand certain use cases even beyond finance or have some sort of um, synergies with finance, such as compliance, regulatory compliance, and legal activities. So for those things, we are looking for pioneer groups as well as um, subject matter expert groups. 
So that's great. And this rollout strategy, and just this is for the community's benefit, uh, we want to get people onto the playground, like Shruti is talking about, to help us uh, develop certain features and test out certain features. And so that's why these playgrounds are going to be very, very um, important to us, both on Plutus and on Marlow. And Marlow does depend on Plutus to, uh, in terms of the main net rollout. So they're, they're going to be staggered in that sense. However, we can at least start getting the feedback in and also people to play around with the code and, and play around with the, with the constructs before, beforehand. And to that effect, Mike was brought in as product UX a few months ago. One of his projects that um, I've given him was around Marlowe because it is so user facing and in terms of usability, we can make a pretty big impact there. So Mike, actually you've taken quite a bit of time taking a look at the playground and have suggested some improvements to, to enhance the usability of it. So I'd like to bring you on and have you show, show the community kind of what, uh, what you've been working on. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, yes, um, I've been meeting with the Milo team very regularly, and we've um, we've found some some problems with the interface that, that the way it, it's growing, mm -hmm. that the um, it couldn't create a a really optimal workflow. So I'll show you, I'll show you what I've done. This is the amazing Milo logo. So we have a new we have a new product. It's a uh, it's got its own little brand. It's 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 quite nice. It's purple and blue, but um, Marlow is um it's it's amazing in its simplicity. Okay, I said that before, and we are trying to remove the um how to the elite uh, the, the label for you need to know millions of lines of code to to do this stuff. It's 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 not true anymore. We're making it as simple as possible try and bring everyone into this ecosystem. So there's a logo, beautiful. Um, so like I say, I'm a UX um, designer and uh, I, I drew this. This is, you know, if anyone wants to have a copy of this, probably on GitHub. Um, this is the flow. This is how the Marlowe playground works. So this is the, you know, it's not all that interesting, but that's, that's the bare bones of it. Um, if, Currently, this is the um, the alpha version of it that you people can use, and it's going to um, so so it's going to change to a simpler a simpler workflow. And to do that, I whip up these wireframes and uh, I analyze analyze them um, as much as I can. And so this is a this is a wireframe for the Haskell editor. So if you go back really quickly without Without boring you too much, the um the ha the editor has three languages in it. It you can it currently as we're going to um introduce it the very the first next version you'll see you can write in Haskell, you can write directly in Marlowe, or you can write in a visual um block language called Blackly. It's a sort of a standardized thing. I I'm not sure who makes it. It's an open source uh, um visual programming language, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, you, anyways, all three of those are more or less equal. You can start in any one of them. Uh, the only difference being that Haskell has to be compiled to Marlowe before it can run, but it's a, it's a very, very minor step. Um, so that's the, like the playground is it, it, it existed now and, and that wireframe. And this is, this is now the um, uh, screenshot, the design of the, of the Marlowe editor. So um, it's, it's made, it's simplified and, sorry, this is the Haskell editor. This is, this is, this is, so if you want to start in Haskell, you can, you can write your code in Haskell and you can generate your Milo from it, okay? And you can also save and, and um, these to uh, GitHub as a gift. Um, you can also write your Milo contract in a language called Blackly. And this is the, the kind of uh, visual block language that I was referring to. This um this is uh, basically a drag and drop interface where this is this is a screenshot so I can't show you how it works but you drag bits of of uh, blocks out here and those represent code when you when you like um what you're doing and it uh it actually you can actually run this when you like what you're doing you can generate it generate Marlowe from it directly 
Um, and also you can, you, can, you can write your contract in Blackly and then you can go to the Milo editor. It will convert directly to Milo and you can edit in native Milo. And this is, what native, this is a native Milo code. So you have three, op three options for coding. Um, and uh, they're, all, they're all equal. It depends on what you like and what you know. Um, and further on, there we are. Uh, this is this is an example page, so this is not um, this is not a uh, real code, but this is a, a mock-up of of our demo files. We're going to have lots of demo files on different types of of um, financial products, like S we have escrow, loans, zero coupon bonds, options, swap, guaranteed bonds. I don't know a lot about finance. I'm learning, but um, there will be a lot. If, if you know about finance, there'll be a lot of things for you to experiment with, play with, and uh, and hopefully, um, you know, write your own and share them. Put put them on GitHub. Make more open source documents. You know, whatever. Um, that's pretty cool. But what's really really cool is next page is we're going to expand to use the world's most popular and some sometimes maligned uh, JavaScript language, which which is like, uh, I mean, runs on over uh, several billion devices if you want. But uh, obviously, you, Milo doesn't run on several different billion devices, but you'll be able to write your contract in JavaScript and it will be a smart contract and will it'll have all the, um, the ability to check to see if your contract is working with our static analysis that's built in. So JavaScript will, will be your source. Milo, it will generate the domain specific language of Milo and Milo being, being our language that we developed especially for this can be checked for errors. So you don't go and, you know, well, spend all your money or lose it. And, um, and that's what really exciting. And that, that won't be too far off. We're, we're working, working on that, um, quite uh, diligently. And that's it for my screen sharing. I'll stop. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, that's that's actually quite a bit of work. And, and you know, we do have uh, we do have resources. So Simon, you've done a couple of these demos and talks, right, in, in the past on the Marlow sure. Playground yeah. as it really stands. So there are the, the team's going to put uh, some of the links down in, in your box there. So please click on that. The Virtual Summit has some information as well as there's some YouTube videos that Simon's done in the past mm -hmm. on the playground. So for those that are not familiar with how it currently works, please go get familiar with it if, if that interests you. And then what Mike's shown you is some of the improvements that we're doing to make it even more uh, of, a, of a factor here. And a lot of this is going to come out in an alpha phase, uh, as Shruti's mentioned, at the end of October. So we're really excited. So for the next show, we'll have a lot more to talk about in terms of this particular product. So really good work you guys uh, on this excited yeah. about. All right, um, so Marlo, one thing we can't talk about uh, Gogan without are partnerships. So a lot of partnerships come into play with both Plutus and with Marlo when it comes to adoption, it comes to building, it comes to validating it. it there's a lot of things, marketing even, right? There's, there's so much that goes into it. One of the big partnerships that we are looking at is Actus. Mm -hmm. And Simon's been leading a lot of those discussions with the Actus team and also uh, support for how we put our contracts in the Actus format so that um, it's adopted across a variety of industries in the future. So with that, Simon, why don't you give us an update on Actus? What is it? Why is it important? Same type of spiel and also where we are with it. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So I think what the Actus Foundation people have wanted to do is, is have, they've realized that there are there aren't that many contracts, dif fundamentally different contracts out there in the world. And they reckon there are about 32 different kinds. Of, it's a shame it isn't 42, but they reckon about 32 different contracts out there in the world. And what they built is a taxonomy of these, and they built a very clear mathematical description of how these things work. And so we thought, what better than to take that standard and to implement it inside Marlow? And I think... Working with Actus as partners has been valuable for both of us. I mean, we've had this fantastic application area to look at, but we've also found that, with as with any standard, there are some things which you know, there are little ambiguities in there, and sometimes there are things that have just you know, typos have come in. So we've been able to debug the standard that the the Actus people have built. 
so I think for us, it's a great um, it's a great benchmark for the work we're doing, and it's a um, and working with the Actors Foundation through the Cardano Foundation, um, mm. we we're able to to put our technology in front of a whole lot of key players in this area. So I think it's been a it's a, it's been a benefit in both directions. Um, in fact, what we're doing at the moment, we're just working on a way that we can test our implementation against another partial implementation that's out there in Java. And being able to set these two against each other, we, both implementations will gain in, in, um, in security. So that's, that's a really good thing. And in fact, and if, I'll, we'll talk about this in a second, but yeah, that's, that's it from me on um, actors. Right, and I think what you were about to mention is the fact that if, you know people that are interested in Marlowe and Actus and what this partnership looks like, there is a challenge that was submitted to the Wyoming Hackathon, right? Exactly. And so, um, give us a little more info information on that one. So, what we said, the, the Wyoming ha Hackathon, it's an interesting because everything's gone online. It's no longer a get people in the room and and get them to hack away for forty eight hours. It's a one month hackathon which has a number of challenges and IOHK is a sponsor and we've put in this challenge for Cardano of taking an aspect of our implementation of actors and taking that to the next level. It might be using our ex experimental JavaScript um, version of Marlowe and, and building contracts in that. It might be building a mock-up of a standalone app that uses, um, that uses the act actors contracts. So there's a whole range of things. It might extend another experimental feature of, of, of the playground, which is the Actors Lab. So there's a, a number of challenges there for people with different technical backgrounds, different financial backgrounds to try out. Um, and we'll put, I think there'll be details of how you can get involved with that hackathon will we'll be in the, um, we'll, we'll be in the, the uh, broadcast when it goes out. So links right. will be there for you to join up. Sounds good. I'm sure many of you are interested in that. And just to wrap up this segment on Marlowe, you know, we talked about what Marlowe is, why why it's important, the partnerships, what we're doing on the playgrounds. And uh, I just want to bring it back to the whole voice of community piece or VOC, voice of customer community user. Um, we are doing a lot more. You'll see a lot more focus groups that are happening around all of it, from Shelly to the wallet to and Deadless and, and to Atlas and, and to into Catalyst especially, and we're also bringing that into Marlowe. So Shruti, what are we specifically doing into Marlowe? What are we asking the community? Because there's some clear asks that you'd like to, to hand out here um, for recruiting people, right? Why don't you, why don't, let's leave with that. Yeah, so with regards to our community voice of customer piece, we're really looking to get some insight around um, what kinds of industries and user groups we're able to bring. Even within the sub-industries within finance, we really want to be seeing what kind of um, insurance or maybe asset management or representing derivatives or stock options. So all of those different things, we want to be creating financial instruments as well as user groups around those. And particularly, I'm very focused in the near term for this um, rollout. I'm focused on getting a group of pioneers that are able to test out this Marlowe playground and really getting a feedback around what features they like, what kind of improvements they would like to see on the playground and get their hands on something that is really very much in flight, that we would love to hear the free feedback of people who are actually going to end up using this kind of a product. And so that's one area where I'm looking for certain types of developers, also people familiar with the financial industries, perhaps like financial contract managers and so on. And with regards to Marvel for Enterprise, that is another area where we're looking for a little bit more folks to give us a sort of advisory and informal dialogue, also to understand really what are the problems that you see in the financial industry that can be uniquely solved by blockchain and getting your insight around financial instruments and how we can deploy those on Marlowe. So for those ones, we're looking for subject matter experts, particularly in the area of um, finance and how that ties into compliance and regulatory areas, as well as interoperability. So if you would like to be a part of any of these groups, feel free to check out the type form down below. And that one will have you signing up for either one of these groups. 
Thank you, Shruti. And that wraps up our Marlowe segment. And a big shout out, Simon, Mike, Shruti. Thank you so much. And we'll have uh, more of the more of you guys on the shows as we go forward. And there's lots more traction with Marlowe. So I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 All right. So you just heard about Marlowe, and there was quite a lot of information jam packed in that session. And it's really exciting to know that we will have at the end of October, a playground for people and developers to come to and check out uh, Marlowe's functionality, and especially around the JavaScript piece. That's a, that's a great addition to the roadmap by the team. And we are, we are, you know, we're quite excited to share that. Um, and on top of that, the partnerships with Actus. So making Marlowe, like I talked about earlier on, um, more of a utility play for the domain specific pieces. So the Actus partnership and working with Actus to get there is going to help that along. And Tim, we, we you know, just to pivot, we also talked to Naboja and Vikasan about Plutus. That's right. And obviously Plutus is one of the other kind of core components of uh, Gogan, which also splits into two from the Plutus Foundation offering one level of functionality evolving into the Plutus application framework. So let's go to that clip and learn a bit more about that and also about the ERC20 converter, which I think is also another exciting new development. So Nabosha, in a moment, let's maybe do a bit of a dive into some of the individual components that make up Gogan. But before we do that, perhaps you can just sort of frame things for us a little bit and help us understand what the motivations behind Gogan are as a whole. So with Shelly, uh, we've set the scene for making Cardano one of the, uh, if not the most decentralized blockchain platforms out there. So, and we've already starting to see major effects of this and the community is starting to take over the operation of the Cardano network. Uh, it's taking some time to make sure we've given the community the best possible foundation to be able to do this. And we wanted to set them up to be successful in doing this. Uh, and with Gogan, we are taking it a step further and we are enabling the community to not just operate, but also to join us in building um, an ecosystem of financial and social services on top of uh, that strong, strong foundation that we've built. Or if you will, with Gogan, uh, we'll enable anyone in the community to customize Cardano to fit their own business ideas or social needs. Uh, we want to make sure that most, if not all, of the advantages of Cardano as one of the most decentralized, secure, and very soon uh, one, also one of the most scalable platforms out there is available by default to anyone that wants to build infrastructure or applications on top of that platform. But this is going to be a fairly significant piece of integration of those components as well. Yes, uh, we want to be very careful when we integrate Plutus uh, and uh, multi-asset ladder into the existing platform design uh, brought about by Shelly. Uh, along with the fact uh, that we are making Cardano one of the first uh, proof of stake and UTXO based smart contracts enabled platforms, we also uh, need to approach this with due care to make sure that it's done right. Uh, but we believe this extra effort is in line with our goal of being the most scientifically sound solution in distributed ledger and smart contracts technology. All right, thanks, Neb. So for the for Gogan, the very first functionality we need to enable is the multi-asset ledger. And that in turn provides native token functionality. So Vukasin, for for the community, can you explain what these native tokens are? How do they compare to ERC20? And also go into some of the use cases just to bring back the usability aspect to native tokens so the audience can understand. Yes. So uh, native tokens are very different from their ERC20 counterpart. Uh, so on Ethereum, whenever you are basically transferring a ERC20 token, a smart contract uh, is uh, invoked and executed, which usually adds a lot of cost in the, the execution of that transfer. Uh, native tokens are very different in the way that uh, when you're transferring a, a native token, you're basically doing a very similar operation as transferring a ADA token. This is why we call them native tokens. And uh, this basically brings a lot of uh, efficiencies to, to the ledger and the way that those uh, tokens are transferred. But it also uh, means that uh, you're not going to pay as much as uh, uh, it would cost you to execute a smart contract. Uh, additionally, since uh, this is uh, basically the same as a native token or ADA, uh, it means that uh, the friction when you, you want to integrate that in the exchange or uh, any third party integration is basically the same as ADA, meaning that any exchange that wants to list such a token, they can basically do the same thing they did for ADA uh, with just a flag on, uh, which reduces the technical complexity uh, by a lot. So what are some of the better use cases you would you say on uh, to use native tokens? What are the ones that we're thinking about? 
Yeah, so, so the, there are many use cases, of course, all the use cases that ERC20 tokens are covering, so both uh, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, uh, but also something that uh, probably we should think more about is what are all the use cases where a lot of traffic is necessary, which mm -hmm. currently is not possible on other blockchains, and uh, what are such use cases that we will be able to enable in the long term. Uh, because basically we have uh, uh, the traffic that we can support, and this is because of the way that uh, that our network works with proof of stake. To summarize, you know, I like to look at things in terms of future benefits. So what would you say are some of the benefits to native tokens on Cardano? Yeah, so what we tried to do with uh, native tokens is basically uh, include all the functionality that you would take as granted on Ethereum uh, that was implemented uh, mostly by the community, but have that done natively. So uh, by doing that, basically what we managed to do is increase the efficiency in which uh, we manage uh, those transfers. And by doing that, we increased uh, the, the throughput of transactions that can be super on the network, allowing uh, our users basically to think about use cases that were prohibitively extensive before. Nabosha, um Maybe let's talk about Plutus. Plutus is another one of the core components of Gogan. Uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the name, but perhaps let's just start. Can you just reintroduce us to Plutus? Exactly what is Plutus? Well, Plutus is a general purpose programming language for developing decentralized applications on Cardano and in the Cardano network. Uh, it's basically a subset of uh, Haskell and functions much in the same way as Haskell, and we can reuse much of the Haskell developer toolchain for uh, composing and developing and designing uh, Plutus applications. So what are, the, what are the advantages of Haskell over perhaps other languages? Haskell has been developed by a scientific academic uh, community over a number of decades uh, already, and it's a very stable language that's used for developing high assurance applications in finance or in flight security or similar um, business uh, domains. And uh, it obviously has advantages over languages that were developed uh, recently, which uh, still uh, suffer maybe from some of the uh, childhood uh, diseases. <laughs> okay. So Plutus, we've heard about in two contexts. We've heard about Plutus um, Foundation and we've heard about Plutus Application Framework. Can you perhaps tell us the difference between those? Maybe let's start with Foundation. So we already talked about how we are very careful about um, releasing new functionality on the Cardano network. And uh, Plutus Foundation is just another uh, way of, uh, just another example of this phased approach to releasing uh, new functionality. Uh, we want to actually uh, uh, prioritize the key uh, um, functionality and we want to validate it before we make it more flexible uh, for wider adoption. And we are taking these two steps in bringing Plutus to the wider community. Uh, and the first of them being the Plutus Foundation, which is a key enabler uh, in the effort to engage technology partners uh, to extend Cardano into an ecosystem of social and financial services. So basically with Plutus Foundation, we are making Cardano a programmable platform. Mm. So when we roll out this foundation, Aboja, what can developers do with it? So with the launch of uh, Plutus Foundation, we are basically mm -hmm. um, aiming at technology partners and uh, pioneer developers. And they will be able to uh, develop um, Plutus on-chain code for defining custom and flexible monetary policies for user-issued native assets or native tokens, as we also call them. Uh, and they will also be able to develop Plutus on-chain code that adds a layer of programmability to the rules for validating transactions on the Cardano ledger. And uh, on top of all of that, uh, they, we can also use Plutus for writing off-chain code that uh, adds a layer of automation for submitting, authorizing, and reacting to changes in status of transactions to the Cardano ledger from wallets that hold ADA and custom native tokens. So Neb, the, basically the, the Plutus application framework is, is the next evolution of the uh, Plutus Foundation. Is that a good way to look at it? Yes. So the Plutus Foundation, as I mentioned, brings this um, programmability to the Cardano network. And uh, with the Plutus application framework, we are taking it a step further and we are giving the developers all the tools that they need to uh, 
to uh, improve the developer experience in implementing uh, decentralized applications on Cardano. And those tools would include test automation and also simulation of Plutus application execution in an emulated uh, environment. This would also include a prediction of um, um, execution cost of Plutus scripts uh, on chain on Cardano. And it will formalize best practices for development of Plutus applications and standardized um, the most uh, efficient uh, application uh, design patterns, if you will. Um, and we are introducing uh, more concretely um, state machines uh, to help uh, the developers uh, uh, design their uh, applications more efficiently. Um, and the way that uh, applications interact uh, with the wallet and with the ledger, uh, as well as how they react to changes in the ledger state, uh, will also be uh, formalized uh, be as part of the Plutus application framework. Yeah, thanks, Nev. I think that's a pretty good understanding of like what's under the hood. There's a lot in the architecture of Gogan and Plutus specifically to, to get us to this smart contract functionality with the value proposition that we spoke about earlier on. Um, but let's go back to the developer experience and the onboarding side. You know, it's exciting to hear that developers will be able to get to do these things in stages in terms of a rollout. But the very first stage that you and I have discussed in the past is about playgrounds, because Marlo is doing something similar, and we're taking that same approach to Plutus. So explain to the community what this playground is going to look like for Plutus and how they can use it. So Plutus Playground is basically a web development environment for people to try out um, development of decentralized applications with Plutus. It requires no setup, being a de uh, web development environment. Uh, and this will um, give early exposure to, 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 let's say, early adopters of Plutus. And it will allow them to author their first lines of Plutus code. It will allow them to study reference implementation. It will allow them access to early developer documentation. And they will be able to execute Plutus code in an emulated environment and test how it would actually work once uh, we have Plutus uh, um, in the Cardano uh, mainnet. Um, it will help our uh, technology partners uh, and also developers in, um, assess in technical assessment of uh, Cardano and Plutus as uh, uh, as a host platform for the decentralized services that they might have in their pipelines already. Yeah, that's great. So it, some of you um, would have uh, known Mike Susco from the last show that we introduced in a segment, and he's also working on the Marlowe Playground. But Mike, being the product UX manager, he's also going to be working on the Plutus Playground to get us this to get us this experience going and to have this back and forth feedback from the community and from our developer community in how we go about building it. So we're very excited about this, this playground piece and more to come on that. Um, so to just wrap up the segment on Plutus, there is another project that we are working on and this one promotes interoperability, but also provides a frictionless way for developers to be able to br be brought onto this current platform, uh, onto the Gogan ecosystem. And uh, Vokashin actually is working as the lead on this particular project, and it has to do with the RC20. So, look, share more details with our audience about this. I'm sure they're going to be excited to hear. Yeah. So, with native tokens, we already reduced uh, the barrier to entry by a great degree. But we wanted to go a step further. We wanted to make it even more uh, uh, convenient to create tokens on Cardano. And uh, we mainly wanted to focus on uh, the people that already have some tokens on Ethereum. So we made something that we call the ERC20 converter. Basically, this tool uh, allows the users to migrate all the uh, users they have on the source network. In our case, uh, we will start with Ethereum and basically expand in other blockchains as well and basically manage the entire migration of those users and their respective balances of tokens to Cardano. Uh, this process uh, wouldn't be easy without a tool like that and uh, basically want to cover all the steps necessary in order to that, do that process. Later on, we'll be adding uh, on top features that uh, might uh, help them do the KYC and things like that. Uh, now, also something that we want to think about in the future is how do we actually use a similar tool as uh, the RC20 Conver, but not for just the RC20 tokens, but also for uh, proof of work blockchains that don't want to manage uh, the ledger for themselves. And this is because we have such a scalable infrastructure beneath that we can leverage in order to accommodate also other blockchains that, that we're currently using uh, proof of work uh, consensus. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, very soon we'll have more information uh, as we are getting closer to the launch and we'll share that with the community. 
So thank you uh, guys for that. Now we've we've touched on partnerships already today, Aparna, around the context of transactional metadata. But of course, another critical partnership that's being developed is with people who are going to help improve the developer experience. And I think you uh, you had a conversation earlier this week around that. You, you know, Tim, this is the, one of the best parts of my job is to figure out the build by partner angle to what's out there. I mean, we're building great technology. Um, partnering with someone that's also built great technology that complements what you're doing instead of reinventing the wheel. Uh, I love doing that piece. So I did catch up with uh, John Hughes, who's the co-inventor of QuickCheck. That's something that we already use and looking to partner with him to build something very similar for Plutus that's going to help with the developer experience. So let's take a look at that. Well, community, it's uh, very exciting today for me to introduce uh, someone who doesn't really need much introduction in the Haskell space and in the functional programming space. Uh, but I am very honored to be bringing John Hughes onto the show. John has been uh, is a leading computer scientist, and he's also a functional programming enthusiast. And for more than 40 years now, he's uh, he's been doing this for at universities such as Oxford and Glasgow and Chalmers University in, in Sweden. He has served on the Haskell Design Committee. He's co-chaired the committee for Haskell 98, and he's authored uh, more than 100 papers. And one of the classics in that space is why functional programming matters, which uh, has has a lot of um, has a lot of merit on the circuit. He is also the co-inventor of QuickCheck, which is a tool that we use here um, at IO for for building our products. And he's the co-founder of Cubic. So, John, welcome to the show. It's really, uh, really good to have you here. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So, John, for the benefit of our community and for those that are newer and don't really understand the Haskell space and, and haven't don't under don't know you um, in in the market, um, could you introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about Cubic and, and the company? Uh, yes. So um, I. I myself got interested in functional programming way back um, around about the, the 1980. And um, I learned the very early functional programming languages at that time. And what I loved about it was just that my code was so short and so clear, mm. and I could so productive compared to the languages that I was used to. I was using a before that a forerunner to C, um, which I wrote a lot of code in. Okay. And uh, after I learned the first functional programming languages, then going back to the old way, it just felt like wading knee deep through porridge. <laughs> and uh, so I was in love, and I've been in love with functional programming ever since. Um, so I think you were interested in, in how QuickCheck came to be. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, that was actually uh, around about 2000, well, the late 90s. And I've been doing something very important for some research project. Uh, I've been working very hard and I can't at all remember what it was. But the day came when I had finished. I'd met my deadline. And I had nothing to do for a little while. And I just had some idea about properties and testing. And I thought, I'll just try that out. And um, so I, I made a, a little prototype. Uh, Kuhn Klassen, my co-inventor, came okay. into my, my door and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm having a bit of fun. Um, here's what I'm up to. And next day, he made a new version. And then we swapped code to and fro. And we had the first version of QuickCheck running in about a week. and um, we did it purely for fun. We didn't have research funding for it or anything of that sort. It was just that we were, we thought it would be cool. And I think um, that is one reason why property-based testing is fun. That was its first purpose, but it's fun to, um, to test our code. And uh, so that, that was great. We, we wrote a paper and we won an award. That was fine. Um, but uh, some years later, then our funding agency, I, I was leading a large research project, and um, we showed what we were doing. We were using QuickCheck a little bit, but the project was had its focus on something else. 
and we had to demo our research results for the funding agency's committee. And um, so I did a little quick check demo and then we demoed the other stuff as well. And one of the people sitting in the audience was Mike Williams from Ericsson. And he said, can you just go back to that quick check stuff? We want that. And that's why uh, I started Cuvic together with Thomas Arts, my co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, it was thanks to the funding agency really that brought us together with people from Swedish industry and Ericsson in particular, and um, Mike Williams and the Erlang uh, team at Ericsson got really excited about it. And that brought us together. That's how we started the company. So we had that's, a customer before we founded the company. I think that's the right way to do it. it, it right. I, I, I feel the same way. I always feel like customer-led in, in, innovation in, is, is some of the most am amazing stuff that comes out of it. That's a really interesting story. I actually didn't know that. That's, that's pretty neat. So Cuvic has now, you know, it's it's progressed. Quick Check is just one one sort of product that you do. You, there's lots of other services that that uh, Cuvic provides as well, right, John? Yeah, that's right. So um, we've built our own version of Quick Check, and um, uh, when we first took the, what we had produced in the lab out to Ericsson, uh, then it, it felt a bit like trying to fit a, a round peg in a square hole. Uh, because um, Ericsson software was very much more complicated than anything that we had tried to work with before. And so we had to make a lot of extensions. And we've put a whole variety of extensions in over the years. Um, so there's uh, some state machine testing that we put in quite early on, and that, that is now um, being emulated in a whole variety of property-based testing tools. I think our, our ideas have uh, spread quite far, actually. Um, but we have our, our product um, that we continue to develop. Um, but we've also found that uh, although I thought when we invented property-based testing that obviously this is the best way to test your software and obviously people will just be able to pick it up and run with it, mm -hmm. but it turns out that um, it's a very different way of thinking. And um, so quite a lot of our business is in helping people see how to, uh, how to employ property-based testing effectively. And um, that was um, where we came in to work with uh, IOHK for the first time. Um, IOHK were already using uh, the Haskell version of QuickCheck. And mm -hmm. um, we looked at, at the code and, uh, well, it wasn't using it to best effect. Okay. So, uh, so that's why I ran a number of training courses uh, for IOHK. And now I think I've trained, I've trained about 30, 40 people in the development team. So you have a, a lot of property-based testing experts now. We do, and we have a lot of fans as well. So Quick Check is one of the things that we actually put in as a value proposition for, for our product, because uh, we made the bet to, to actually build this on Haskell. And um, in terms of blockchain, you know, in terms of blockchain velocity, Haskell is a little bit slower for us just because we make sure we do the testing right the entire way. I know you have a different approach to this. You think actually it can go a lot faster. Um, so I, you know, I come in as a product person. I was like, well, why can't we just get things done in like every two weeks, for example? <laughs> like just put it out there. But that's not how it works. And that's the value proposition of our code, though. So when you look at the market and what they're actually asking for from a blockchain, Put it. I, I'm I'm sold on on Haskell as a base product, and also on the testing that our engineers are doing to go forward. Because you are right, it kind of it, it's like go slower to go fast in my mind. And what I mean by that is to get to a certain part, we take our time and test it. But eventually, when you do see some lower level bugs or anything that comes up in the software. Forensically, the team is so quick at figuring out where this is and then how to move forward. Is that is that kind of what you were? You know, we had this discussion a little earlier today about going fast with uh, with functional programming and, and quick check and, and all of that. Yes. See, you, of course, you can hack Haskell code together quickly, just as you can in any programming language. But it won't necessarily. That's not necessarily the right thing to do. The nice thing about functional programming is that it lets you think about 
the behavior and the, the properties of your code um, mm -hmm. much more easily and express them as quick check tests. And when you do that, and when you're generating tests, uh, instead of just trying to come up with examples, mm -hmm. then it's amazing how you find deep, deep mistakes. I mean, I, I, have, I give a talk sometimes about some of the bugs we found. And uh, the kind of thing that QuickCheck just shows us is, um, well, in the first product at Ericsson that we tested, it, it was uh, for connecting a phone call. And okay. it, it customers one by one. It turned out you add the first caller, then you add the second, now the call's in progress, but then you can remove a caller. Usually you'd remove both of them. But actually, once you've removed one, you can add a third. Okay, so you take one out, put one in, take one out, put one in, take one out, put them in, take one out. And the, when you take out the third person, we crashed something in the system. Okay. Think about right. It's in, in, out, in, out, in, out. Nobody would write a test case that does that because it's just such a weird combination. But that was the smallest combination that crashed the code. And um, there, you know, code very often, when there's a mistake in code, it very often needs something moderately complicated to provoke it. We found so many bugs that. Nobody would ever write in a test suite because you look at it and you think, why, why would you test that? Right. Yeah, that is the case that reveals the error in the code. And because, because it gets shrunk automatically, so you, you're presented with the simplest failing case that um, mm -hmm. you know, where everything in that failing test is relevant, mm -hmm. then it's quick to diagnose and to figure out what the problem actually is. That's so, right. Yeah, this is the way to develop software. You, you say your team are quick to figure out what the bug is when they find them. Well, yeah, that that's the point. Yes, exactly. And, and so that I'm sold, right? So we we had um, we went through this exercise. Shelley's been out for two months now, and that's what we've been finding. So anytime there has been a smaller bug or improvement that we needed to make, the team's so quick on being able to diagnose it and, and fix it. It's quite amazing, actually. So that attests to what uh, the suite that we're using. So, you know, given that Cardano has kind of bet itself on, on Haskell, Plutus, which is a part of our Gogan era and the smart contracts era, is also a Haskell derivative in a way. It's built on upon Haskell. And uh, just, for, just for the members of the community in our audience, we have approached John and Kuvik about partnering with us to do the same thing for Plutus contracts that will be available as a tool set for our developers. And, you know, we're still in the, in the, in the early stages of figuring this out, John, but, you know, I, I can see great value. What do you think in, in being able to provide this to our uh, developing community, developer community? Sure. I think it's very exciting. Um, so contracts, smart contracts is clearly an area where it really matters that the code is right. right. We've all read about cases with, with thefts of millions of tokens. Uh, and of course, nobody wants that to happen just because they made a, a small mistake in a smart contract. And this is the kind of place where, where property-based testing uh, can really deliver a lot of value because it's just going to show the mistakes in contracts like that. Right. Um, now, exactly how we're going to do it, we have to work that out, of course. We had a, a nice meeting yesterday with a um, uh, few of the development team. And mm -hmm. it sounds as though the basics of the way that the um, contracts work is rather similar to other cases that we've looked at in the past. So I, I think the ideas that we've been developing in the last decade, we're going to be able to deploy them here and uh, hopefully make something that really makes a difference to the reliability and the quality of smart contracts that people deploy. And I think that's, that's a very exciting thing to work with. I think so too. So we are definitely looking forward to this partnership and we're gonna be working with you guys and doing some brainstorming sessions here in, in the next week or so on, on what types of tools we can build and how sophisticated we can start to make them over the course of, uh, of our rollout cycle for, for Plutus. And I just wanted to leave the community with this, like John and his team have done such great work with QuickCheck and also some of the other services that they've provided and the training they've provided in, in, uh, in 
property-based testing. They're the premier experts on this. And so bringing that experience into Plutus to our developer community is something that I am looking forward to, our company's looking forward to. And we'll share more with you guys as we go forward and get a little more advanced in what this looks like and how this shapes up. But uh, giving you a sneak peek into, into what we're doing for our developer community on testing. So John, thank you so much for appearing on the show. It's a great honor to have you. And uh, we'll look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. So Aparna, that's nearly it. Uh, a truly bumper show. Uh, we hope that some of you are still with us watching live. Thank you. As I say, there'll be timestamps uh, coming up uh, in the show recording so you can deep dive into some of the sections as you wish. Now, look, we'd have loved to have packed even more in today. We'd have loved to talk more about the Haskell developers who are literally just graduating from the Haskell course we've been running in Mongolia. We'd also love to have told you more about the activities at the Wyoming Hackathon, some of the activities we've been doing there and will continue to do throughout October, including two exciting developer challenges. But we'll have to tell you more about that uh, through other channels. Maybe let's just play out today with uh, another piece of uh, content which we'd like to share with you in full soon. But uh, Charles was in Wyoming and he sat down with our friend Ben from Singularity.net. Um, and let's maybe just play out with that clip. So what excites you most about Cardano? What, what about the project um, is compatible the way you think? Yeah, what, there's a number of things that excite me about, about Cardano. And so the simplest thing that we can get from porting SingularityNet to Cardano, by which we mean initially putting a significant chunk of SingularityNet AGI tokens on, onto Cardano. So mm -hmm. what, what I want to do is make Singularity Net platform infrastructure multi-chain. I mean, we, th we had that in our minds from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So right now it's all on Ethereum, which is expedient at first, but it doesn't have to be all on one blockchain. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe it will be optimal for it to be all on some other blockchain. But for starters, we want to make Singularity Net infrastructure multi-chain. So some of the AGI token supply remains on Ethereum and some migrates to, to Cardano mm -hmm. and then how much remains on Ethereum and how much goes to Cardano, you know, that, that, that's sort of for the community and, and the market to decide, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if the Cardano portion works much, much better, right, then, right. then everything, should, everything should migrate there. If it turns out the Ethereum portion is more useful for some purposes right. and the Cardano portion is more useful for some purposes, then then so be it, yeah, right? So it's almost like um, hosting infrastructure, you know, yeah, yeah. Rackspace versus Amazon or Azure. It, these are ultimately cost and quality decisions that you make right. for your customers. And, and these are both moving targets, right? Like right at this exact moment, Ethereum is very, very frustrating to deal with, right? Like it's exactly. insanely slow and expensive to do simple things. But I mean, that's a moving target. There's Ethereum 2.0. It, it, it may be that it becomes great, great at, at at something. I, I don't, I don't want to write it off, right? At, at, so I think the simplest thing that we can get from moving a, a big chunk of Singularity under Cardano is just a less inefficient and overpriced blockchain infrastructure, right? right? And I mean, that's obviously is, is critical to us uh, creating a Singularity net that, that fulfills our goals and, and becomes a decentralized intelligent system. I mean, the, the whole process of designing Singularity infrastructure was a matter of trying to artfully work around the slowness and expensiveness of, 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 of Ethereum, which has just gotten, gotten worse and worse. But there's limits to how, how much you can do there, right? So we, mm -hmm. need, we need a faster, cheaper blockchain. Cardano, I, I think, can be that. But there, there are other things that, that, that could be that also, right? So I think there's also deeper aspects of the Cardano vision and infrastructure that are interesting to me and that synergize with, with, our, with our singularity net code now and with our singularity net aspirations going, going forward. So I think that there's a big focus on formal verification in, mm -hmm. in the Cardano world. And as a mathematician, that's, that's very interesting to me, right? Like I would, I would love to see automated theorem provers running in singularity net and leveraging the singularity net decentralized AI network. I'd love to see these decentralized AI based automated theorem provers put to work 
you know, verifying smart contracts running on Cardano and, and helping verify Cardano infrastructure code, right? right? So there's, obviously there's, there's a number of steps to, to get to where this is really being done like on, the, on a efficient and, and, and large scale basis, but it's, 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 some, it's fairly clear how, how one would do that actually. It's just, there's a, number, there's a number of steps to get there. Yeah, and actually this is one of the most exciting parts about these types of partnerships for us because your needs help evolve our ecosystem. So when we look to the future, we say, okay, well, we've built a great blockchain, but what ancillary technology do we need to put into the system for it to be useful at a global scale for many different uh, utilities? We say, okay, should we do heavy investment in homomorphic encryption or into zero knowledge proofs or to multi-party computation, whatever? We look to our partners and we say, well, what do you guys need? Where do you want to go? Uh, what type of marketplaces do you want to be involved in? And how can we help build this technology together and make that consumable infrastructure to grow with you? One of the other things about Cardano that's not as well known at the moment, but it's a huge pillar of the project is, is the Volterra component of the project. So this is the governance layer of Cardano. And yeah. we kind of break it down into the who pays and who decides side of things. And uh, right now, uh, as the network is running, about $6 million worth of ADA is put into a treasury account. So oh, $72 million a year at current market price for decentralized funding of projects. Uh, and what we decided to do is we're trying to structure Voltaire in a way that there's a strong innovation management component to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem I just gave is an example where I'd say I have a challenge, something like I want to codify all of U.S. law in a way that machines can operate and, and, and give me meaningful uh, answers about. Well, then there's a discussion of, well, how to do that, how much does it cost, how many companies need to be involved, and so forth. And this is really the crux of the Voltaire framework. It's a collection of tools to help that process along to go from an unstructured, open challenge to an actual plan of attack with funding behind it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Singularity Net's future evolutions or OpenCog's future evolutions could actually run through this process and get funding for it. So as your application evolves, not only does it provide use and utility, if you make a good argument of how enhancing that use and utility is beneficial to the Cardano ecosystem, you can now get funding for it. Mm -hmm. The coolest part is it's funding for the open domain. There's no notion of intellectual property or patents or big company owning these things. So the outcome of this process is the uh, evolution of all of the tech for everyone to the benefit of the entire ecosystem. Uh, so I guess the question I, I have for you is, um, uh, given that we have these capabilities and you know, we're working together, uh, what would be the most successful collaboration in your mind? If you had to say, you made the decision come to Cardano and you look back at that decision five years in the, in the future, uh, what types of things had to have happened for you to say that that was a good decision, a successful collaboration in your mind? So th there, are, there are two separate but coupled high-level goals that, that I have in mind with SingularityNet and with the SingularityNet Cardano partnership. Mm -hmm. So one, one is making breakthrough progress toward general intelligence, right. right, which is the closest thing to my heart as a, as a, as a researcher. So I mean, if, if our technology developments aligned so that through integrating SingularityNet with Cardano, you know, coupled with our ongoing work on OpenCog Hyperon, if that came out so that we could create AGI on this decentralized platform, I mean, that then, hey, then, then I don't care if we got the other goals done, right? <laughs> I mean, then, I mean, then of, cor of, course, of course, that will be a tremendous financial windfall for everyone who's contributed, but it also ob obsoletes uh, much of the current money economy also, right? So that substantial progress toward AGI is a foremost thing in my mind. The, the, the other thing that's highly critical and that obviously ties into that is getting real traction in the world for decentralized AI. I mean, now almost all AI is done within a few large tech companies and uh, working closely with, with, with uh, some government agencies. And the vision of SingularityNet, as well as other projects in, in, the, in the blockchain meets AI space, I mean, the vision is that most AI developers and most AI users 
don't need to deal with big tech companies, right? The, the, the vision is that most AI should be done in a more peer-to-peer way with individual developers or small groups creating AI agents that cooperate with each other and, and, and serve users who access AI through this decentralized network. Now, right now, we're starting to get a little traction on SingularityNet, but it's teeny, teeny, tiny sliver of, of what big tech is doing, right? So, I mean, we need to get meaningful traction so that at least a, a non-trivial plurality of the world's AI processing is being done in the decentralized ecosystem rather than, than by, by big tech. This is an example of, of when people say Cardano needs partners, Cardano needs projects. It's not the quantity of projects matters, it's the quality of the projects and what they seek to do and what these projects do to the platforms that they're hosted on. Uh, so uh, for me to answer the question that I asked you, what's my hope out of the partnership and the growth of this over the next three to five years, your needs force very difficult business and technical requirements on the capabilities of Cardano as a platform. And there's no reason to go and pursue these unless there's a commercial partner, a platform, an application that wants that. Much like CryptoKitties kind of forces the discussion of scalability on Ethereum, similarly, SingularityNet forces significantly more involved requirements on us. So it makes our system better. It makes me a better CEO. It makes Cardano a better protocol by having these things in our orbit and collaborating with them and asking questions of how do we actually service these needs and allow you to achieve the goals that you have. That's a very important way of looking at it. And I think in, in SingularityNet as well, people in our community are constantly right. asking me, well, Ethereum's too slow. Ethereum's too expensive. Why don't you move on to a faster blockchain? And of course, there's something, there's something to that. On the other hand, it's, it's a very narrow way of looking at it. Exactly. Right? And uh, what we need is not just a faster blockchain. We need a framework that will let us take the proto-AGI code now inside the OpenCog system and split it out across a decentralized global network so we get a general intelligent global brain that respects you know, data sovereignty and, and democratization. Right. And, I, and, and I, that's about more than just a faster blockchain, right? Exactly. And, and I cannot wait to have these conversations throughout the years, especially as we get into data privacy and how to mine that. Well, there's never enough time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, this has been an interview with Ben and Charles uh, talking a bit about SingularityNet and Cardano and some great ideas. And I hope to do many more of these with many other partners. Thanks for a great conversation. Cheers. So with that, thank you very much to everybody and we'll see you next month.